Because if you don't know German, you know how it's going to be pronounced, and it's not, it's not a diet of words. Um, it is the uh, parliament, really, of the Holy Roman Empire uh, at Helle-Wernst, which is a city in Germany. Um, this is a parliament that is held irregularly, different places, different times, in the course of the 16th century. And 500 years ago, 500 years ago today, it turns out, um, Martin Luther was standing in the parliament of Diet of Worms in front of the most powerful person in the world, Charles V, Emperor Charles V. Um, the most powerful person in the world. He had just recently been elected emperor. Um, yeah, you elected emperors in those days. Uh, there were only six people or seven who elected the emperor. Uh, they were called electors. That was actually their title. There were six or seven, I forget which now. And um, these electors um, were princes in Germany. So I'm just sort of sketching out the political situation, which is so different from our situation that it takes a little um, filling in the background. They're princes, but that's not princes like in English. In, in England, if you're a prince, you're the son of a king or a queen. In Germany, in the 16th century, if you're a prince, that means you're the ruler of a territory in Germany. There's lots and lots of little territories in Germany with their princes, some of whom are powerful princes, and the really powerful princes are the electors. Um, Luther comes from electoral Saxony, which is to say the part of Saxony in Germany which is run by the elector, Frederick. Protestants call him Frederick the Wise, for reasons that maybe we'll get to. Uh, so the electors are important people uh, because the, the emperor is elected. Now, the emperor, Charles V, uh, is also, by hereditary right, the king of Spain. He's the grandson of Ferdinand and Isabella. You know, the Ferdinand and Isabella who sent Christopher Columbus um, on his way. He's, he's their grandson. He also is hereditary ruler of the Netherlands. By hereditary ruler, he's also um, inherited uh, the, the title of the Duke of Austria. He's from the Habsburg family. We all know the Habsburgs, right? Um, so by, by birthright, he, he runs Spain, the Netherlands, Austria, but then he has to be elected to run Germany uh, as the Holy Roman Empire. The, now, as people famously said, I mean, it's a kind of a joke, it's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. <laughs> but that's the title. Uh, when, when Luther writes him a letter after the Diet of Worms, he, he gives all the titles including Caesar Augustus, right? Um, these folks claim to be the successor of Caesar. Charles V also thought of himself as the successor of Charlemagne, right? Charlemagne is French for Charles the Great, way back in the 18, uh, way, 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 he was crowned in 8, 800 AD. This is you know, about 800 years later, right? And he's still carrying on the Holy Roman Empire. And as the Habsburg, uh, heir of the Habsburg uh, dynasty, he really ends up ruling most of Europe. At a time when you know, there's no railroads, it takes a long time to get from Spain to Germany. Uh, so he's traveling all around Europe, meeting with princes and so on. And he's starting this uh, early on. He's only 20 years old, Charles V is. He has just recently been elected because of some complex politics and I'm not gonna be able to get into all the details about the politics, but it's complicated. So here we are. It's April 18th, 1521. This is going to be the second day that Martin Luther faces Emperor Charles V. He's facing Emperor Charles V with the whole Diet there. All these German princes, electors, uh, various kinds of rulers, it's the second day he's faced him, 
The first day was a bit of a dub. He stood in front of a, a pretty much a steering committee of the Diet, not the whole Diet. But the emperor was there, young Charles V, and he was asked two questions. Martin Luther, are those your books? That, but, but by this time, it's a, it's a pretty sizable pile of little books. Right? Those are your books. And they read out the names of the books. Luther said, yeah, those are my books. OK, you're going to recant and take, you know, revoke and, and repudiate these books? Uh, give me some time to think about it, is what he asked. Mm -hmm. Give me some time to think about it. And so they grumbled, but they gave him another day. So here he is coming back. Can, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me now? No. OK. Um, I'm happy to take the mask off if, if that's OK with you folks. Okay. Yeah, well, I think so. I have been vaccinated. I don't really think it's okay. All right. Is that clearer? Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. So, to review, <laughs> Martin Luther, are those your books? We'll read out the title. Uh, yeah. Martin Luther, will you recant and repudiate those books? Um, give me a little more. Give me a little more time on this. He answers. So the next day, uh, in the afternoon. He's going to answer, will he take back, will he recant all of these books? And that's when he says, no, I can't do that. I just can't. Uh, I can't do otherwise because these are books based on Holy Scripture. And unless you can show me that my teaching is not biblical or give me some really clear reason why it's wrong, I can't in good conscience stop teaching what's in these books. Right? If you can prove to me that I'm wrong out of scripture, then I'll, I'll recant right away. Prove to me that I'm wrong out of scripture and I'll give that up immediately. But if you can't do that, then here I'm stuck. I'm stuck here. And that's when he says this famous thing. Um, I can't do anything else. Here I stand. God help me. It, it's not really a defiant thing. It's like, here I am. What can I do? God help me. Although sometimes it gets translated as, here I stand, I can do no otherwise, God help me. But, but the God help me is the actually important part. Right? He's feeling stuck in a corner. Right? He is a monk, uh, not an important person. He's facing the most powerful man in the world. He uh, is very reverent towards authority, it turns out. Um, he's kind of an authoritarian down to his toes, is Luther. He hates the notion of defying legitimate authority. Um, and it, but his soul is at stake, not just his life. Right? If it was just his life, he's ready to give up his life. He's been saying this actually for months. He's saying, I'm going to go to Worms, and yeah, I'm going to die. That's fine. I can do that. But I can't betray the word of God. If I do that, that's my soul. Right? So he's willing to die, but he's not willing to betray his soul. He's not willing to deny the word of God. And he thinks that his teaching in these books is teaching the word of God. Now, you can disprove that if you want. It's okay to, to, to tell Martin Luther, look, your, your, your view is not scriptural and here's why. That's what, he's in, that's what he's challenging them to do. Show me that I'm wrong out of scripture. Um, but they can't. Uh, the politics of this is a little funny too. Um, it's a very weird thing to be having a trial for heresy in a diet. Right, in front of the emperor. Normally, it's the church who puts you on trial for heresy, right? And, well, down in Rome, down in Rome across the Alps, they've been wanting to grab Luther and bring him down to Rome to put him on trial for heresy for, for years now, right? But the elector, Frederick the Wise, um, Luther's ruler, has been delaying, dragging his feet, making excuses, He's a very clever man, is Frederick the Wise. He's not going to defy the Pope, but he's going to say, well, you know, I don't think he's going to get a fair trial down there in Rome, where you clearly intend to burn him. Right? Couldn't we have a fair trial in Germany? Right? So this becomes a political football. Right? The Germans versus the Italians. That's going to be a big issue throughout the Diet, the Germans versus the Italians. Frederick is saying, look, 
your, your, your holiness, your, your pope, I mean, you've got these Dominicans down there who really don't like Martin because he's an Augustinian, right? He's from the wrong order of the church. It's kind of like an inter-service rivalry, army versus navy, right? Dominicans versus Augustinians. Luther's an Augustinian monk, the Dominican monks don't like him, and they're, they're ready to burn him at the stake. They, quite literally, they're ready to burn him at the stake. They have already burned his books right, in Rome. Uh, they burn his books also in Cologne and Mainz. They, they, there have been book burnings already. Of course, Luther responded by burning the Pope's stuff. Uh, in, in, so that's already been happening on both sides. But right now they want to burn him. And normally what would have happened is the emperor would have said, you know, you're not, you're refusing to recant, you're a, a, an obstinate heretic, we're going to arrest you and take you down to Rome. That's what would normally have happened, except Luther has come to Worms from Wittenberg, traveled down there using a safe conduct. The emperor himself has issued a safe conduct. That's a promise that you're not going to be arrested. You're going to be able to go home safely. So Luther reminds everybody of this quite a number of times. Now again, he's willing to die, but not to betray the word of God. And if he can escape with his own skin, that's good too. And at the end of the Diet, um, well, he spends another week with people pressuring him privately after April 18. Uh, they, they, they try to twist his arm, and it's, it's the same story over and over again. He said, prove to me that I'm wrong out of scripture, and I'll recant readily, gladly, happily. But no, you can't prove that I'm wrong out of scripture because my, my, my teaching is scriptural. So after trying to pressure him for about a week or two, Luther just goes home. <laughs> but Frederick the Wise, <laughs> a clever man, um, he realizes that Luther's not really safe. So he tells Luther in advance, you are going to be kidnapped on the road back home. You're never going to make it back to Wittenberg. I'm going to get you kidnapped, and, and you know, it's going to, you're going to pretend to be highway robberies, and nobody's going to know where you are, and you're not even going to know where you're going, but don't worry about it, you're safe. So on the road back to Wittenberg, after the Diet of Worms, uh, a bunch of highway robbers come, and they threaten everybody, and they grab Martin Luther and take him away. And um, he ends up uh, in a castle near Eisenach in northern Germany called the Wartburg. If you do any Luther studies, you'll run into this label. Useful to know. Bart, as in Wart, Wart, which is um, a, a big castle on the hill, oh, no, right there. Um, I think it's right there, yeah. So uh, it's a castle on the mountains overlooking Eisenach. Luther spends most of a year there translating the Bible writing sermons, uh, producing the first set of sort of sermon booklet of, um, of Lutheran sermons, uh, basically producing the, the literature of the Reformation, which is what he's been doing for the past couple of years. But in the Vart work, he's got nothing to do but write, right? and that's what he does. Um, that's actually one of the important features of all this. Luther can really write. Um, he outwrites his opponents, both in terms of quantity and quality. He writes you know, with rhetorical verb. He, man can, can write a sentence that you remember. But he also just writes so much. Right? Um, in 1517, back when he was doing the 95 Theses, he had not written a single book in his own name. Um, he had published a, well, actually later he published a, a book of, of mysticism. No, he hadn't written a single book in his own name. By the time you get to 1521, you, there's a pile of small books which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so there's this pile of small books. He's been writing this stuff. And of course, there's this recent invention called the printing press. And boy, does that make a difference. If you're someone accused of heresy, the printing press is your friend. Because burning books is pretty effective when you don't have printing, right? There's not that many copies of your books if you're a heretic, right? They can burn your books, they can burn you, they can wipe you off the face of the earth, which is the whole point about burning heretics. You want to eliminate them. Right? You can't do that with a printing press. Right? Um, just to go back to 1517, right? we, you all celebrated the 500th anniversary back in 2017, right? Well, Luther wasn't quite yet Luther in, in 1517, and there's a story about how he becomes the Luther that we know. 
But one thing that happened that, that is characteristic of what happens with Luther is in 1517, he has these 95 theses. He posts them on the church door because that's actually a university regulation. <laughs> the 95 theses are a set of theses for, for a disputation, which is a university exercise that you have uh, in the middle medieval universities. He's going to debate these theses. Now, one of the things he tells us is that he is not committed to these theses. Right? He thinks some of them are not, probably not true. Some, some of them are certainly doubtful. He's not committed to any of them. Right? But he wants to debate them because there's a problem about indulgences, which we may be able to talk about. There's a problem about indulgences. So he wants to debate this stuff. He's a university professor. He's a Bible professor at the University of Wittenberg. And he wants to debate these theses, which he's composed. So he posts it on the church door. Right? It's in Latin. It's not meant for the, for the ordinary people. It's, it's a university exercise. But somebody must have grabbed a copy and reprinted it. And then somebody translates it into German and reprints it. And then further down the road, there's a town where they reprint it. And there's little printing presses all over Germany. And it goes, it goes viral. Right? It's really the first document in Western history that goes viral. And pretty soon, there's copies of this thing in German all over Germany. And that's a political problem. Um, to review something you might have learned way back in 2017, these indulgences, right, you pay for them, right? And guess where the money goes? It goes to Italy. It goes to the Pope. Uh, part of it paid for St. Peter's down, down in, in the Vatican. Um, so, the Roman church is in the business of exporting money from Germany to Italy. Everybody in Germany knows this, especially the princes know this. Right? Now they've got a champion, a theological champion, saying, you know, the Bible doesn't tell you you have to do this. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you need to, to pay all this stuff for, for your spiritual safety to, and, and send it to Rome. I'll, I'll try to work out some of the details here in a minute, but the basic idea is sort of like this. It's sort of like protection money, right? You know, it would be a bad thing if something happened to your store if it blew up or something, right? But I can ensure that that happened. That, that's sort of the mafia kind of protection. Well, it's an old tradition in Italy, evidently, right? <laughs> this is how the Germans think about the Italians, right? They're fleecing us, right? They're, they're, it's spiritual protection money, right? If you buy indulgences, if you pay for masses to be said, then um, that might keep you safe spiritually from going to hell or, or purgatory, which is almost as bad as hell, right? So there's a lot of money crossing the Alps and going to Italy. And Luther is saying, but that's not in the Bible, right? What's in the Bible is that Christ died for you. And you think that sending money to Italy is, is going to keep you safe spiritually? No, no, no. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. And faith alone is enough. Faith alone in Christ is all you need. Because by faith alone, you take hold of Jesus Christ. And that's all you need. Right? And he, he'll, he'll thunder about that. And he'll get angry about that. Because Rome is not just fleecing with this kind of protection scheme. Rome is, is, is torturing people's consciences. That's the theological issue. So let me say a little bit about these books that Luther is writing and what it has to do with the, the freedom of conscience, which is, for, for Luther, the big issue. Okay, some of these books. Uh, Luther's books, um, he's gonna write a lot more before he's done, but already in 1520, He's written four of the most influential books ever written in Western history. Right? The Reformation has already begun. It didn't begin in 1517, but it's well underway in 1520. The four of the books out of about a couple of dozen, well, a dozen and a half, four of the books um, you might be familiar with. The first one, early on in 1520, he writes a treatise on good works. Treatise on good works. I'll talk about why that's so important uh, in a minute. Uh, then there's uh, the address to the German nobility. Right. Once again, it's an 
political issue. It's the German versus the Roman Church. Right? Um, so this is very much a political topic. Then there is the Babylonian captivity of the church. I hope that's legible. <laughs> Notice the theme of freedom. Right? The church has taken captive something that ought to be free. And then the last and greatest of them is the little book, The Freedom of the Christian, which I think is one of the great books Church history. Freedom of the uh, That and the large catechism, I think, are Luther's two greatest books. Um, okay, so, so these four books he had written in the past year, which is pretty astonishing. The theme is freedom, freedom of conscience, because mm, let's think about protection money again. If you are paying protection money to the mob, right, you are not free. You're not free to withhold that money from the mob, right? Because you're afraid that something bad will happen to your store if you don't pay the protection money, right? So fear is how you're kept in bondage. Fear keeps you in bondage to the people that you have to pay off. Now that's fundamentally the structure that the Germans were seeing in this protection racket that the Italians had over them. Um, the way it worked was this. They, they would bind your conscience. Right? Freedom of conscience was the issue. So let's talk a little bit about what conscience means in the 16th century. Uh, in the 16th century, we're in the late Middle Ages. Right? Early in the 16th century, the Renaissance hasn't really happened in Germany yet. It's, this, it's the late Middle Ages. And conscience is the place where conscience is the place where the church gets its hooks in you. Because conscience means consciousness of sin. Conscience means your awareness of what a sinner you are. And the spiritual protection racket works on that awareness by making you afraid. Right? Making you afraid about your sins. Making you afraid of sin and death and hell. Luther will famously, if, if you read much of Luther, you, you'll get these lists, these enemies lists. Sin, death, devil, hell, the law of God, the wrath of God. These are the things you're afraid of. And because you're afraid of them, they can bind your conscience and say, well, look, if you buy these indulgences, then maybe, or if you pay for these masses to be said, then maybe, maybe. It's never certain, never certain. That, that, that's what keeps the fear going. Um, just to give you maybe one example, two examples. Um, you go to a church in Europe, a big cathedral, and you walk down the center of the, the nave, and you know there's all these little chapels off to the side, right? And nowadays they're empty. But in Luther's day, each one of those chapels would have a priest in it saying mass as quickly as possible, very quickly, maybe dozens of them in a day, because people would pay for masses. They would pay for masses to be said every day for a year. And some semi-literate priest who you know, could barely read, but could remember the Latin, would just recite this, uh, you know, and go through the mass as quickly as possible, and then do it again, and again, and again, and again. Because the mass was a sacrifice. Right? It's a sacrifice offered to God. It'll please God and satisfy God and, and prevent people from going to hell. Right? So you pay for this. And some of it goes to this semi-literate priest who's probably living with a housekeeper and their, their children. But the priest, by the way, has to pay off the Pope or the housekeeper and the children and so on because he's not supposed to have a woman that he's living with and children. But he pays for the Pope and then it's kind of okay. Right? And you pay for the priest. But of course, some of the money goes to Rome. Some of it goes to the bishop um, and so on. Um, so what's happening is that your conscience is becoming part of the economy. The late medieval economy is, a, is an economy that, that extracts money from people's consciences, from their fear of going to hell or purgatory. Let me say a little bit about hell and purgatory. Um, purgatory has changed in the past 300 years. Let's talk about purgatory first. Um, if you have ever read Dante, 
the great 13th century or 14th century poet uh, of Italy, you'll know that purgatory in Dante is a good place. There's literally angels around every corner. People pray for each other, they help each other. Right? They're being purified, they're longing for heaven, there's sighs and longing, but there's music. There's music around every corner in purgatory, in Dante's purgatory. By the time Luther is growing up, 300 years later, purgatory is basically temporary hell. Instead of angels, there's devils. Right? There's shrieks of torment. There's thousands of years of torture. Not purification of the souls of you love God more. That's Dante. That's also the current Roman Catholic view of purgatory. That's why you know, people like Benedict XVI still believe in purgatory. They believe in Dante's purgatory. Right? A place where you're, you're, the love of God is purified in you. Right? Now that's not exactly biblical, this purgatory, but it's not, a, it's not a horrendous notion. In Luther's day, purgatory was horrendous. It was something worth avoiding, right? Thousands of years of torture. So one way to avoid this is to buy indulgences. Now that's what, what the issue was in 1517. Um, and particularly you would buy indulgences for your dear departed mother and father and, and other relatives, right? Because chances are they're not perfect Christians, so they're being tortured for a few thousand years. Um, but if you drop a coin in the box, then especially if it's a plenary indulgence, which means the whole, the whole schmear, you get to take your, your poor dear mother who's being tortured and you get to send her straight to heaven just by dropping a coin in the box. Now, what kind of son are you if you're not willing to part with a few dollars, a few silver dollars, put them in the coin, and save your mother from thousands of years of torture? Come on, you can do that. Even if it's not quite certain, you can do it. It's worth a try, isn't it? to save your mother from thousands of years of torture. Luther says, this is not just uncertain, this is a scam. Your mother is saved by faith alone in Christ. Your mother, if she's a baptized Christian who believes in Christ, has the blood of Christ to free her from her sins. That's a whole lot better than a silver coin or these indulgences sent by the Pope. And of course, by the way, you know, where does the money go? It goes across the Alps into Italy. So that's the, the purgatorial side of it. Uh, you've, got, you've got a lot of machinery to try to reduce your time in purgatory. Indulgences are one thing, masses as a sacrifice are another. And then, of course, there's hell itself. Uh, hell itself has some biblical background now, and the, the horrible thing about hell uh, is not just that it's torture, but you never get out. Right? In purgatory, at least it's temporary. With hell, of course, once you're in, you're in for eternity. This is absolutely terrifying. The sheer helplessness of it, right? Talk about terror, right? And Luther, when he talks about conscience, does not use the phrase guilty conscience. He talks about terror of conscience. Because when you're aware of your sins in 1521, you're not thinking, oh, I'm, I feel so bad about myself. No, you're thinking, dear God, I'm gonna be tortured forever. This is why way back when Luther was uh, still a law student before he became a monk, he's walking back to law school um, and he's out in the uh, field with a thunderstorm and he prays, Saint Anne, help me, I'll become a monk! Because a thunderbolt could not just kill you, you know, sudden death is, is terrifying enough, but it could send you straight to hell. Um, we've got this problem. Um, we're all sinners, kind of everybody knew that. Um, some of our sins are worse than others the idea. Some of them, you know, they'll just spend you, you know, they'll just cast you a few years of torture and purgatory. But at least that's, that comes to an end. But some of your sins are mortal sins, right? Deadly sins. They're mortal because they take away the new life that you get in baptism. Right? One of the things that Lutherans and Catholics have in common is the notion that you're born again in baptism. You get a new life in Christ. And the Catholics then say, yeah, but you can lose that new life by mortal sin. The mortal sin is mortal because it kills the new life in Christ that you get in baptism. And if you have a mortal sin, then you go to hell and you can't get out. So what do you do about this? Over and over again, what do you do? You've got a conscience that's terrifying you. What do you do? Well, of course, you go to confession. You go to the sacrament of penance. And what you do is you look for all those mortal sins that, are, that your conscience is aware of. Luther calls it a kind of torture of conscience. 
because you're, you're, you're digging around with the help of a priest who, who said, well, have you done this? Or that? Are you irritated at your neighbor, the next-door neighbor? Is that irritation enough that you are secretly kind of in your heart of hearts you wish they were dead? Jesus had something to say about that in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Um, or or you, you looked at this pretty girl and, um, uh, you know, it wasn't just a sidelong glance. Maybe there was lust in your heart that made, means that in your heart of hearts you're an adulterer. That gets you into hell, too. So any little ordinary sin could turn out to be mortal if you didn't, if you didn't watch out. Right? So you're trying to confess every single sin. Because right? if one of those sins is left and unconfessed, you go to hell and there's no getting out. Can you imagine the terror of this? Right? Absolute terror. Um, and then imagine hearing some monk preaching what you should do is trust that Jesus Christ is your savior, that his blood was shed for you, and that he has promised you forgiveness of sins, and you have no right to doubt that. So you have no right to be anything other than certain that you are going to heaven because Christ is your savior. So none of this uncertainty, like maybe this will work, maybe I paid enough in, in the, for the indulgence, maybe I've said enough masses or had enough masses said for me, no, Christ's blood is certain because Christ's promise is certain. And at the heart of the gospel that Luther wants to teach people is that the promise of God in Jesus Christ is what you can hang on to. And it can give you certainty because God keeps his word. One of Luther's favorite sayings from the Bible is, let God be true and every man a liar. That includes my own conscience. That includes myself. I don't have to trust in myself, my good works. I don't even trust in my faith. I trust in the promise. My inadequate faith can still be enough to save me because what saves me is not my faith, but the promise itself. And the promise is the promise of Christ. And Christ is my savior. And that is enough to deal with that terror, that terror that so many people in the 16th century were feeling. So that's what Luther's writing about. Um, we have them until 10 o'clock, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's say a little bit about these, these, these writings. Um, because by this time, the Reformation really has begun. Uh, even though Luther's still a monk, um, of course, in the letter to the German nobility, he's basically saying, you know, it's time to let priests get married. He hasn't yet attacked the vows of monks, but he's already attacked the notion of, of priests having to be celibate. Why? Well, because what's actually happened is that your average parish priest in the 16th century has a housekeeper and children by that housekeeper and pays the pope and the bishop in order to legitimize the children and, and a concubinage fee, it's called, right? You actually, the priests actually pay the bishop to have a housekeeper that is not a legitimate wife. Luther says, oh, come on. Um, these women deserve better than that. These men deserve better than that. Let them have honorable marriage and let them have legitimate children. There's just no reason to keep them like this. That's just one of many things of these abuses that he attacks. And, and in the German nobility uh, book, he says basically this. This protection racket, this scam that the Roman church is running, these people are not going to reform themselves. They're making too much money off of it. So the, the, the rulers of Germany people like the elector of Frederick the Wise, you folks need to take this in hand. You folks need to reform the church. We need a reformation, and it's gonna to have to be the secular powers, right, the, the rulers of Germany, who need to do this. And you see, this, this is about power, right? The rulers of Germany will, in fact, take the church away from Rome and say, let's have um, an evangelical, that is, gospel church. That's why we talk about evangelical Lutheran churches. It comes from the word gospel. Let's preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's have pastors who are married, who are supported by their local congregation. The money goes to the pastor. It doesn't go to Rome. Right? Um, and let's have um, the Christian rulers of Germany care for the spiritual health of Germany. Right? Because clearly these, these, these Roman bishops, they, they don't care. They're, carrying, they're fleecing the sheep. Um, so let's have the rulers of Germany. The, the assumption is they're Christian rulers. We're not talking about separation of church and state here, clearly, right? The state has to intervene and fix the problems in the church. That's what Luther's saying 
you know, the, the rights of the German nobility. Um, and the German nobility were ready to listen because they didn't want their wealth flowing over the Alps and into Italy. So um, uh, Luther's proposal had some political legs, fine. But uh, let's talk about conscience now. Um, starting with, uh, on good works. Luther's already famous for, for teaching people that you're saved by faith alone. That great Protestant watchword, faith alone. Behind it, as Luther always says, is, is Christ alone. Right? Being saved by faith alone means being saved by Christ alone. By putting your faith in the gospel alone, which is the promise of God. That's why it's certain, that's why you can rely on it. But then, immediately, already, people have been telling this young monk, Martin Luther, but well, wait a minute, are you saying you're not supposed to do good works? You're undermining the good works of Christians. You're undermining works of love, because good works are all fundamentally works of love. You're saying we don't have to love in order to be saved. We don't have to do good works in order to be saved, right? Good, grief. Christians are just going to start believing that they're saved and, and then going off and doing all sorts of horrible things, right? You, you think you're saved just because you believe you're saved? Come on! That's going to be disastrous. It's going to be a social disaster. People are going to commit all kinds of sins. And Luther says, no, that is not what I'm saying. Um, faith alone means that our good works don't save us. Of course our good works are still commanded. Right? So the, the treatise on good works is actually an exposition of the Ten Commandments. It's, it's an exposition of the Ten Commandments, which, yeah, God is still commanding us to do good things. God is still commanding us to love our neighbor. But it's going to work very differently. Because now our good works are not in bondage. Like Luther will say our good works are free. We do the, our good works now because, well, because our neighbors need them. Right? Think of the difference between doing works of love in order to show what a good Christian you are so you get saved. Because you really got to do those works. Because if you don't do those works, well, then you're going to go to hell. And boy, you better do those works. You have to do those works. You must do those works. Your conscience is bound <coughs> by those good works. Because if you don't do those good works, you're going to hell. There's still versions of that in, in Protestant churches to this day. Right? If you're not a good enough Christian, maybe you don't really have faith. Maybe you're not really a Christian. Maybe you're going to hell. Right? Um, that's a good way to bind somebody's conscience. Luther says the good works are free. They're, they're free because you're not trying to prove something. You're not trying to prove that you're a good Christian. You're not trying to sanctify yourself. Christ is your sanctification. Um, you're not trying to justify yourself. You're not trying to save yourself. That's all the business of Jesus Christ, and you can trust him for that. Meanwhile, your neighbor needs you. That's why you do good, good works. And it pleases God that you do good works. God wants you to do this. That's why he commands it. So by faith, Christ gives himself to you. By love, Christ gives you to your neighbor, that Luther says in the Freedom of a Christian. Right? So love is Christ giving you to your neighbor in love. And that means that you ask a different question. Instead of asking, am I a good enough Christian? Am I a loving enough Christian? Am I, are my good works good enough? You ask instead, is this really helping my neighbor? Is this really good for my neighbor? I want to do good for my neighbor. That's what love asks. Love does not ask, oh, am I a loving enough Christian? The answer to that is no. Love asks, is this doing good for my neighbor? Your good works are not good enough to save you. But they're good enough to help your neighbor. That's why God is pleased with them. Right? He's not trying to you know, get you justified by making you a, a good enough Christian to justify yourself. Because in fact, here's one of the radical things that Luther says. All of your good works are sins. He says that flat out. All of our good works are sins, period. In fact, at one point he says, all of your good works, all the good works of a pious Christian are mortal sin. Every single thing we do deserves damnation. So don't try to do things good enough. Don't try to be good enough. Don't try to do good enough works. Don't try to love enough. None of that works. All of it is mortal sin deserving nothing but damnation. You have no hope at all for salvation except Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Give up that bondage of trying to prove that you're good enough. You aren't. But Christ is good enough. And he loves you enough to shed his blood for you. And he's going to make a Christian out of you. And it might go pretty far. You make saints out of people. Right? But they never save themselves. It's always Christ who saves them. So you do good works. Luther's absolutely emphatic about that. Right? 
The law of God still applies, but it's not how we justify ourselves. It's not how we save ourselves. It's not how we measure ourselves. Uh, we measure ourselves by Christ, who is our Savior, and by the promise of God in the gospel. Okay, so you can see already where this is going with the freedom of the Christian. I'll, I'll jump to that last one, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful things ever written. Um, he's, Luther starts out by saying, Christian is kind of two, Christian life is kind of two-sided. On the one hand, there is no one more free than a Christian. A Christian is free from the law, the sin, death, devil, all these things, including the law. Because the law does not tell us what we have to do to get saved. The law does not touch our conscience, says, says Luther. So our, our conscience is free, our good works are free, but our good works, right, our good works make us servants of everything. So a Christian is Lord and free from all laws, and a Christian is servant of everyone. Right? Perfectly free, perfectly servant, both. Right? In faith, we are free. In love, we are servants. Right? And that's how the freedom of a Christian works out. Uh, you serve under And then, the battle in captivity, go, go to that one. Um, that one is the one that gets him called a heretic more than anyone else. Uh, actually, probably these two, not the German as well. Um, when Luther gets called a heretic by the Bochumers, they're not actually interested in the stuff about salvation by faith alone. Right? If they actually cared about the theology, they would focus on that, because that's the radical theological claim that Luther is making. But instead, they're, they're interested in getting enough funding to build St. Peter's. And it's these two books, the German nobility and the Babylonian captivity, that attack that economy. That economics, which essentially um, uses these terrified consciences as a, as a basis of a protection racket, in particular the Babylonian captivity. It's about the captivity of the sacraments. So, um, as you may know, in the Roman Catholic Church there are supposedly seven sacraments. Luther comes along and says, nah, two, maybe three at most. He's a little bit ambiguous about that. Because penance, it turns out, is a sacrament, in Luther's estimation, that really is, is not a different sacrament from baptism. So if you count them, they're really only two, two sacraments. But Luther loves the sacrament of penance, properly practiced. Um, and that's actually, let me say a little bit about that, because that's how he ends up becoming the Luther we know. The, this, the theology of indulgences, way back in 1517, is attached to the sacrament of penance. It's about how to make up for, make satisfaction for your sins. Um, you know, you've got these venial sins, you've got to work them off, as it were. So um, indulgences says, eh, you don't have to work off these sins in purgatory. Luther, fascinating, in 1517, when he's writing the uh, 95 Theses, he hasn't really thought about the sacraments before. This is something, that, it's striking, if you read Luther's writings before 1517, we got some of his class notes and lecture notes. He's hardly ever thinking about the sacraments. But in 1517, when he's, when he's talking about indulgences, he's going to have to start thinking about the sacrament of penance. And this is, this is something radical to happen. He says, well, okay, so what's the basis of the sacrament of penance? It's, it's the uh, promise of the keys, right? I will give you the keys of heaven, um, uh, uh, says Jesus to Peter. And then Luther very quickly says, that, that's given to Peter for the sake of the whole church. The, the, the keys are given to everyone, not just to, to Peter, but to the whole church, to every Christian. Um, why? So that any Christian, man, woman, or child, for heaven's sakes, can forgive, can announce the forgiveness of sins in Christ's name. So if you have this, this terrified conscience, and you're worried you're going to hell, take the sins that are terrifying, confess them to any good Christian, and that Christian is authorized to say, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the word of absolution, it's called. It, it mimics the word of baptism, of course. That's part of it, right? Um, but it's based on the promise of the keys, which is the promise of Christ. So Luther says, the promise of Christ is something you can trust in. So if Christ promises that whatever is absolved on earth is absolved in heaven, then you can count on it that when someone in the name of Christ absolves you of your sins, that that's true. 
that your sins are really absolved and forgiven. You can hang on to that because you're hanging on to the promise of Christ when you hang on to that word of absolution. Um, that is actually the first time that Luther talks about justification by faith alone, faith in the promise. There's a, some complications that I'm skipping over, but the, the first time that Luther talks about justification by faith alone in the promise of Christ is when he's talking about that word of absolution in the sacrament of penance. And it's, it's this wonderful blessing. If your conscience is terrified, you've got a promise. It's as if Jesus Christ himself came to you and said, I forgive you your sins. Do you believe that or not? You think you're going to hell? No, I forgive your sins. You don't have a right to think you're going to hell anymore. Because right? Jesus Christ himself says otherwise. So that's one of the things he's fighting for. But does Rome believe in that? No. Rome wants to take these sacraments captive. Take our consciences captive in order to make a lot of money from them. And we've already you know, for, sort of covered some of the ways that you can make money from a guilty conscience. And that's part of what's going on with the sacrament of penance as it is used by the Roman church of the 16th century. Likewise, there's um, the, the, the mass, um, as it was called, the Eucharist or the sacrament of the altar, as, as Lutherans will call it. Um, Luther says, look, the Eucharist certainly is, is a real sacrament. It's instituted by our Lord Jesus in the scriptures itself. But um, what's this business about not letting ordinary people take the wine as well as the bread? Right? Why is it that you priests think that only the priests get to have the wine, which is what was going on. Um, ordinary people could only have the bread, not the wine. Somehow that they weren't good enough for the wine. Luther's saying, no, 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 no. Every baptized Christian who believes in Christ, every baptized Christian gets to have bread and wine because our Lord himself instituted the Eucharist that way. And we're gonna go by the Bible, right? The Bible has more authority than the Pope, right? Uh, well, not according to the emperor, it the end of purpose. Uh, then there's also the transubstantiation. Luther says, yeah, look, you can believe in transubstantiation if you want, but what really matters is that Christ's body and blood are present. If there's still bread and wine there, that's okay too. The body and blood of Christ can be in the bread and the wine. Um, and if you think there's no bread and wine, yeah, you made an extra miracle, it's not necessary, and you have no right, you folks in Rome, you have no right to require people to believe in miracles that are not in the Bible. You have no right to say, you're not a good Christian unless you believe that that's not really bread anymore, that's just the body of Christ. Luther says, it's still bread. The body of Christ is there in it. Right? That you have to believe because Christ says so. And you do have to believe what Christ says. But you don't have to believe what the Pope says. Especially when the Pope says, you believe this or you are not a Christian, you're going to hell. Don't believe that, believe Christ instead. You can see how this is undermining a whole structure right, of, of, of terror an economy built on terror of conscience. And then, um, last but not least, about the Mass, about the Eucharist, um, there's this business about the Eucharist being a sacrifice. That the priest, Roman Catholic priest, is, is offering a sacrifice, and that this sacrifice can, can help take care of your sins. Luther says, no, no, no. Don't turn the Eucharist into a good work that we do for salvation. That, that's the same mistake that when you try, as when you're trying to save yourself by your good works. And you, then you pay for the priest to do it for you. No, 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 don't, don't do that. Right? The Eucharist, the sacrament of the altar, is a gift. Don't turn God's gift into your work. Because your work is never good enough. But God's gift is good enough. Take hold of God's gift. It is free. It is promised to you. Jesus said, this is my body. It's given for you. So believe that. Believe that. That's, that's what the, the Eucharist is for. So that Christ can give himself to you to be received by faith alone. Right? Don't turn it into some sacrifice that some priest makes on behalf of your mother's soul in purgatory. So, put all these books on the table and ask Martin Luther, do you recant? And Luther says, I'm trying to give people the gospel of Christ, which has been stolen from them by this protection racket that they're running in Rome. Right? And Furthermore, by the way, incidentally, I'm trying to prevent all this money from being shipped from Germany down to Italy. And that's why I'm being called a heretic. And I can't give up the gospel of Christ. Right? You can kill me for that, but I'm not going to sell my soul 
for, 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 for this thing, even for the emperor. Even for the emperor, I will not sell my soul. Here I am. I can't do anything else. God help me. And that's how it ends. And as a result, um, at that point, the deal was sealed. There was going to be a reformation. There was no turning back. Perhaps it was inevitable, but it was quite a dramatic conflict, quite a dramatic moment. And at that point, basically everybody knew there was going to be disruption. There was going to be a reformation. And alas, there was going to be a split in the church. But if the Roman church can't you know, reform itself, what can you do? You ask the princes to help you. Um, one last thing about that. The Roman church has gotten a, a good deal better since the 16th century. Right? Um, and it turns out many of the abuses that Luther was fighting against are, are gone. Not all of them. Um, but the issue remains of what to say about faith alone and justification by faith alone. Although I'm not so sure that that's as deep a division between Lutherans and Catholics as it is between Lutherans and everybody who's trying to justify themselves by being good Christians, which includes a lot of Protestants. Right? You don't often hear in Protestant churches the kind of preaching that Luther would call the gospel. Um, uh, and sometimes, well, in the old liturgies, you hear it all the time. I heard the, 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 the gospel preached beautifully in a Greek Orthodox church. Um, because this it was a Greek Orthodox priest who knew that Christ is our Savior. And he did nothing but point to Christ as our Savior. Right? Luther would have entirely approved. So, so the ecumenical situation today is rather different than it was 500 years ago. But 500 years ago, Luther had to stand up for the gospel. And he had to stand up at the risk of his life. And everybody knew that there was a lot at stake. And Luther went home, went through a fake kidnapping, and started translating the Bible. And before you know it, you had a reformation, but you also had a split in the church. And that's roughly <laughs> the legacy of the Dieta Burps. So we have at least a few minutes for questions, and if you, if you have any questions, uh, you might want to write them down, because we'll have a lunch afterwards, and I'll be glad to answer questions. But I think we have a few minutes for questions now. So any questions people want to ask about all this? Yeah, what would, what would be most important to Luther is the gospel. Or the Bible or something? Uh, um, well, the gospel is part of the Bible, right? Um, the way he thinks about this is the Bible is all, all of the Bible is the word of God. Right? All of it from cover to cover. But the, God speaks in different ways. One way he speaks is gospel. That's what happens when he makes a promise. That's what happens when he tells the story about who Jesus is. That's what happens when the prophets say, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. That's, that's also gospel. Then there's another way God speaks. He lays down the law. He makes commandments. Right? That's a different way of speaking. It's in the Bible, and it's God's law. But it doesn't get the same priority that the gospel does. And the reason why is that the law can't save us. And why? Because the law tells us what to do. Period. Right? The law tells us what to do. And nothing we do saves us. Now, it's still the law of God. We should still do it. We never do it as well as we should. If we want salvation, right, if we want to know who God is, then we need to go to the gospel. Because the law can't do that for us. Right? So even though the law is, is the law of God, right, and, and it's just as much the law of God, it's just as much the word of God as the gospel is, the gospel is the saving word. Because what the gospel does is it gives us Christ. Right? The law tells us what to do. The gospel says this is what Christ did. Right? He died for you. So the, the, the gospel takes all of this out of our hands and puts it in Christ's hands and says, believe this, it's true. Christ died for you. And that's why it is more important than the law, because it's the saving word. And by the way, I think if, if you want to think about what's the difference between gospel and law, I think that, for Luther, is the fundamental difference. The law tells you what to do, the gospel tells you what Christ does. Right. Um, because the gospel comes out so clearly in those two 
writings of his. Um, the freedom of a Christian, I think, is the single best treatment Luther ever gives of what the gospel is, and how it gives us Christ, unites us with Christ, justifies us by giving us Christ's righteousness, all that stuff. And he does it in a way that's just, just absolutely beautiful, um, because he compares it to a marriage. Christ is our bridegroom, and it's like, um, the image he uses, it's, it's like you know, the king comes to a, a prostitute and says, I hope you don't mind, but I want you to marry my son. And we'll take you to the palace, we're going to clean you up, we're going to dress you in golden robes, and we're going to have you, all the wealth of the kingdom is going to be yours. And, and then, you know, what are you going to do with all the wealth of the kingdom? You can do what your bridegroom does, you're going to give it away. Right? So you, you now become a different person because you're, you're united with Christ in this spiritual marriage. And that's how justification works for you. It's just gorgeous. And, um, the large, large catechism is, is a bit more sprawling, but at the heart of it, again, is, 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 is the gospel, especially when he talks about the creed. Right? But he also would have, the, he have a version of the treatise on good works because he has the Ten Commandments, and he has lovely things to say about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and those two are, are the great pastoral documents of Luther's writing. Um, the Freedom of Christian and, and, of course, the large catechism. I don't know if you use that in this church. Maybe you use the short catechism as well. But these are pastoral things. They help build people up in the faith of Christ. Um, and I, there are bits of, of the short catechism which I wish every, um, every Christian knew. Why do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Well, Luther says, uh, I'm, I'm only paraphrasing, but I believe, says Luther, that I cannot believe. But the Holy Spirit has given me the true faith and preserved me in the true faith. Right? So why do I believe that I'm a believer? Not because I look in my heart. Because when I look at my heart, I see a lot of unbelief. But I believe in the Holy Spirit, who has given me faith, right? And is preserving me in faith, and will preserve me in faith forever. So you even believe that you're a believer because of your faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit, right? I wish every Protestant would know that, right? And the Catholics, too. The Catholics are a little closer because they have better liturgies than the Protestants. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. John Hus, yeah. Um, he burned at the stake, yeah. yeah. So, um, I know that Frederick Eli was asked to Luther, what other, what were some other factors that played into his different outcomes? Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay, right. I Luther mean, like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Part of it is that Luther's writing all these books uh, that get printed. So, so you can't wipe it out. Frederick the Wise is a huge factor. Um, there's also a bunch of German princes who are ready to, ready to actually take arms in favor of Luther. At the time of the Diet of Worms, they're, they're close to having a riot, because Worms is in Germany, and a whole lot of the ordinary German citizens are, they're, they're doing rah, rah, Luther, rah, and it's like a, a, a cheering, right? And, and there's placards and posters, and there's uh, German princes and knights um, who are saying, hey, Martin, we're ready to, to take arms for you against these, these um, Romans. We're ready to start a rebellion. And Luther calms that down. Um, later on, there's a peasant rebellion, which he disapproves of. But at this point, um, there's, it's politically unstable in a really deep way. And one of the things that Charles V is worried about is he doesn't want to have a rebellion on his hands. But on the other hand, he also doesn't want to be first Holy Roman Emperor who's allowed a heretic to get away. Right? But he's also promised to save conduct, which was negotiated by Frederick the Wise. Right? Um, and meanwhile, the Pope is just doing everything he can to get Luther either to recant or to get uh, arrested and brought back to Rome. Uh, and, but the Pope is too far away. And Charles has promised of safe conduct. And Frederick the Wise is being very, very sneaky and very, very clever. and. and getting his own way while pretend, pretending to be humble and, and helpful. Um, and, and then there's these German, uh, other German knights and princes, Sickingen and Putin, they're called, um, who are almost ready to start a rebellion. Um, so it's, it's a different situation. Um, in, in, in Huss's day, in Czechoslovakia, I didn't, he didn't have enough political support. And he didn't have someone who was as clever as Frederick. I have about four or five minutes of... Oh, wait a minute. 
Right, but you start at 10.15. Ah, okay, we have some time then. <laughs> I'm thinking 10 o'clock, no, 10.15. Um, but yeah, anybody who needs to go and prepare something, please do. But um, other questions? And we'll always um, address these questions again at lunchtime. And I can always yell louder if it's really necessary. <laughs> oh, do you have a question here? No. All right. Yeah. But supporting Luther kept the, the Catholic Church what? It, it, it basically kicked the Italians out of Germany. Right. And that, that was the basic premise for the, the Germans supporting Luther, wasn't it? They wanted to get rid of the uh, Germans. They wanted to, yeah, they wanted um, a German church to serve Germans, right? right? Um, and that's why they appealed to the German nobility. Yeah. And that's the politics of it. That was, um, yeah, the, the Germans were sick and tired of being taken advantage of. We have some that's interesting. Renaissance humanism, because the, the Renaissance has been going on for maybe 100 years or so in Italy. Um, uh, the Pope at the time of the Diet of Worms is Leo the yeah. Tenth, right, right, not Leo, right, Leo the Tenth, and um, he's a he's from the Medici family, right? So we're, we're talking. He's a Renaissance Pope. Now the thing about Renaissance popes is that they're expensive. Right? All these art projects are expensive. They're building St. Peter's. That's expensive. Um, I think they were underpaying Michelangelo for the Sistine Chapel, but still, this stuff doesn't happen for cheap. And um, the Renaissance popes are also famous for, <laughs> they kind of invented nepotism from, uh, uh, I think it's a Greek word meaning nephew, right? <laughs> the popes have lots of nephews. Which is their illegitimate children um, that they make into cardinals, and you know, cardinals have their illegitimate children. And they, they're rich. Right? The Renaissance has to be funded. That's, that's one thing. Um, some of the Renaissance thinkers were pretty secular uh, and pretty unbelieving and undermined the faith. Um, so, one of the things that happens um, in 1510, I think it is, Luther and a, a companion are actually sent to Rome. He, he, back, this back before the Reformation, it's, it's even a glint in his eye. He's a, he's, there's a, a dispute up in Germany that has to be settled in Rome. So Luther and a friend of his are sent by the Augustinian order to talk to some folks down in Rome. And Luther looks around at Rome, and Rome, and he is appalled. Right? Um, because uh, Renaissance Rome is, is it's full of, of unbelief. Um, uh, the, many of these cardinals and bishops are just not, um, they, they're, they're in it for the culture. Okay. Leo the, the, the Tenth is really, <laughs> Leo the Tenth wrote his bull against Luther in a hunting lodge, right? He was off doing hunting, which is of course a, a blood sport that was very popular among Renaissance princes. So the Renaissance Pope for Renaissance princes, one of Leo's predecessors, Julius the Second, well, uh, he, he led an army and, and led a battle against one of the Italian cities because the Pope actually was the ruler of, of a large part of central Italy, right? Um, so that's the Renaissance papacy. Um, now, Luther was not much influenced at all by the Renaissance except in one regard, and this is actually terribly important. One of the things that started the Renaissance was a new awareness of ancient languages, right? Renaissance humanism was fundamentally a recovery of ancient languages. And Luther loved that because it meant a recovery of the biblical languages. So here's one story, then maybe we should quit. Um, one of the reasons why the Pope thought that he had sort of control over much of Europe is because of a document called the Donation of Constantine. This is a document in which supposedly the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor, basically said, the Pope gets to control all of Western Europe. I'm going to donate all of Western Europe to the, the authority of the Pope. 
Um, and, and people still believed in this document in the 16th century, except, well, they would have, except a Renaissance humanist named uh, Vaya looked at it and said, hmm, I know a lot about how classical Latin actually is written. This is not classical Latin. This is ninth century Latin. This is really crappy Latin. Um, and it could not have been written by Constantine. Right? It could not have been written by anybody in the third century. It was written by somebody in the ninth century. That's what happens when you really know your languages. Right? Um, likewise, Luther complains about the, the papal decretals, these papal of these, these popes' pronouncements. He says, they're written in such lousy Latin. Right? It's unconvincing. Right? Give me the pure scriptures. They're much more beautiful. Right? He, give me, instead of this, this tortured uh, alien language, give me the scriptures, right? the, the pure fountain of, of scriptural eloquence. And Erasmus, the great humanist, was helping with that, right? translating the Bible afresh into good Latin. And then, of course, Luther translates it into German. Uh, and that's a, that's a Renaissance humanist thing. And that's one of the fruits of, um, of the Renaissance. I'll say one thing about that, and then, then maybe we should quit. Um, Luther was convinced that the best science of the day, the best learning of the day, was on his side. Because the scientific discovery of the Renaissance the, that really affected culture was the relearning of these languages. And the more you learned about the ancient languages, the more Luther looked like he was right about the Bible. Because so much of, of the Roman Catholic interpretation was based on ignorance of the languages and, and just, just awful writing. Right? And Luther was a great writer. So, so the Renaissance humanism did feed into the Reformation in that way. I guess people are arriving, so I should shut up. But um, thanks a lot, folks, and we'll see you at, uh, at the service.